Good morning. Let me try that again. How about howdy? Howdy. In, in Aggie land. We're all glad that you're here this morning. And I'd just like to point you to a couple of things uh, as it relates to our bulletin this morning. Uh, you'll see there the Presbyterian Women's Fall Gathering is coming up Monday, the August 28th. So that's just, can you turn me on? There we go. I have a feeling y'all have reached the bottom of the barrel when it comes to preaching this morning. And uh, I have a feeling that Byron was just practicing for turning me off uh, when, it, when it becomes uh, blasphemous or something there along the way. So thank you, Byron. Anyway, uh, we have the fall women's uh, gathering, Presbyterian women's gathering. You'll see that on, it'll be two weeks from tomorrow night on the 28th. You'll also see relating to our ladies in our church that we have the mother-daughter weekend at uh, Mo Ranch. And you'll see that those reservations are due by September 3rd. And uh, then also just remember this week, our, our students that are going uh, back into um, back to school this week. So our majority of our students start back to school this week, and then the Aggies will be rolling back into town this week, and then we'll be off and running uh, when it comes to uh, our, our time together. So uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. Um, let's take just a moment, and um, I would like to uh, meet with our young disciples. So young disciples, if you'll come forward, I'll turn this on. You got it? All right. Have a seat. I'm glad you guys are here. All right, so guess what? I'm gonna tell the, the story during our preaching time this morning and talk about something, and it's my favorite story in the Bible. Do you, all, do you know any story about a guy that had a coat of many colors? Come on down, come on, have a seat. Do you know uh, a story about a guy named Joseph? It's my favorite story in the Bible. And Joseph uh, was the favored son of Jacob, and we're going to talk about that this morning and talk about uh, who, uh, who Joseph was. But I'm going to talk about two big words, and so the words are divine providence. Those are two really big words, but I want to break them down for you and break them down for these guys that are out here uh, tonight. Divine means it's godly, okay? That's all it means is it comes from God. Providence is more than just a town in Rhode Island, okay? Providence, it comes from the base word of provide. Do you know what provide means? You know, provide means that God supplies. And we're going to look at two things on that. God sustains us and God uses everything that happens in our life to achieve His purpose. And so the thing that you need to know that this week as you go about and everything that you do, all of y'all have divine providence too. That as you start school and as you do the different things, God is going to sustain you through everything that you go through, even sometimes when things don't work out, maybe that person didn't, doesn't sit next to you at lunch that you want to sit next to you at lunch or something, or maybe a class is not going exactly, or maybe it's not your favorite class, uh, but God is going to sustain you through that. And then whatever you go through, God is going to use in your life to help accomplish His will and His purpose. That makes sense? All right. Will you pray with me? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Father, we thank you for divine providence. Father, we thank you for divine providence. Father, we thank you that you sustain us in everything that we do. We thank you that you sustain us in everything we do. And Father, we thank you that you use everything in our lives to teach us and bring about your will. And Father, we thank you to use everything in our lives to teach us. Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys.
Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 105. O give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell all of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works that he has done. Would you stand and join us in singing together, O God, our help in ages past, hymn number 687. Our prayer of praise, prayer of confession, assurance of pardon is followed by a joyful response. May we now express our praise and our confession as we pray together. Lord, please forgive our weaknesses and our lack of trust in you. We are like the disciples who, in the midst of fears and storms, could only tremble and wonder at the threatening events. Even when Jesus called to the disciples, they shook with fear. But Jesus offered words of encouragement. It was in fear as Jesus called to him and bid him come out of the boat. Jesus replied, and Peter stepped over the edge into the waves. But fear came to him again. And he began to sing. Many of us are protected by that moment when we let go of our faith and watch into our fears. Help us to place our trust solely in you and your call to us. You will guide and lift us to safety. That is the promise you have given us, and we believe it. When our faith slips, scoop us up and bring us peace. Be patient with us, for we are from all, and yet not by you. Give us strong hearts and living spirits to be your disciples. Amen. We pray in silence. <clears throat> Friends in Christ, know this. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting, and I remind, I remind you of this surpassing peace. In Jesus Christ, we are together.
now would you take a moment and greet those around you that are here this morning with an exchange of peace. Now we join us as we all sing our doxology together. seated. My instructions call to introduce our guest preacher. <laughs> Whatever, David, it's good to have you back from your trip to Alaska and looking forward to your sermon this morning. You're a blessing to be with us. Thank you, sir. Years ago, I heard a question raised, how much should I give when the offering is an opportunity? The response I heard was, give until it hurts, and then give a little bit more. May we worship God with our offering.
Almighty God, you have given, we have received, and now we give back and pray that you will receive it with your blessings continuing to be upon us in so many, many ways. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we continue to give with gratitude, joy, compassion, and generously. Amen. Amen. It comes from the chapter, comes from the book of Genesis. It's multiple chapters along the way for its different parts in Joseph's life. Reading from Genesis. And Joseph had been taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelites, Potiphar an Egyptian, one of Pharaoh's officials and the manager of his household, bought him from them. As it turned out, God was with Joseph and things went very well with him. He ended up living in the home of his Egyptian master. His master recognized that God was with him, saw that God was working for good in everything he did. He became very fond of Joseph and made him his personal aide. He put him in charge of all his personal affairs, turning everything over to him. And from that moment on, God blessed the home of the Egyptian, all because of Joseph. The blessing of God spread over everything that he owned at home and in the fields, and all Potiphar had to concern himself with was eating three meals a day. A little bit later, but they're in jail. God was still with Joseph. He reached out in kindness to him. He put him on good terms with the head jailer. The head jailer put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. He ended up managing the whole operation. The head jailer gave Joseph free reign because God was with him. Whatever he did, he made sure it worked out for the best. And then many years later, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, you are the man for us. God has given you the inside story. No one is as qualified as you in experience and wisdom. So from now on, you're in charge of my affairs. All my people will report to you. Only as king will I be over you. So Pharaoh commissioned Joseph. I'm putting you in charge of the entire country of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his finger and slipped it on Joseph's hand. He outfitted him in robes of the best linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He put the second in command chariot at his disposal. And as he rode, people shouted, bravo. Joseph was in charge of the entire country of Egypt. And then a lot further down the road, when Joseph was reunited with his brothers and with his father, Joseph replied to his brothers, do not be afraid. Don't you see what you intended against me? God intended for my good that many lives are saved. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you that you're here and in this place. And Father, I just confess that the sins of your messenger this morning are many. And Father, I thank you that you love us and that you accept us and you take us right where we are. So Father, use us and teach us this morning all that you have to, for us to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, this morning's sermon is about divine providence. And as I begin to get it, dig in and, and uh, work on divine providence, the good news is I've known I've been preaching for about a month now, I guess. And so as I've kind of formulated this in my brain, uh, I usually work on, on it from about 5 a.m. to about 7 a.m. in the morning, you know, laying in bed wrestling. And I've got this to just under two hours, so y'all are, are in good shape. So, <laughs> And as I read the story of Joseph, more and more, it became a story to me. It became a book, almost a play, divided into a prologue, four chapters, four acts, and an epilogue. So if we were to look at the prologue, we have to look at the book of Genesis. Genesis 1 through 11, Genesis can really be divided into two, two separate categories. Genesis 1 through 11 all deals with uh, God and his relationship to the world. Of course, you know the story of Adam and Eve and Noah, and that's chapters 1 through 11. When we begin chapter 12, chapter 12 through the remaining part of the entirety of the Old Testament is all about one family, the family of Abraham. And that's where it begins. So you'll see Abraham married Sarah. Sarah was without child. So he was given his servant Hagar. Ishmael was born out of that relationship. 
And if you think of common times now, Ishmael is the great prophet of Islam. And so that's where that came from. Abraham and Sarah finally had a son named Isaac. Isaac, if you remember with Abraham, was taken to the altar and he thought he was going to have to sacrifice Isaac. And God just wanted to know that Abram, Abraham or Abram was going to be faithful to the end. Then Isaac and Rebekah have twins, Jacob and Esau, but not in that order. Esau first and Jacob hanging on to the heel. of They were twins, but Esau was just a bit older. At the end of Jacob and Esau's life, at the end of uh, Isaac's life, Jacob actually steals his birthright from Isaac. And when he does, he becomes scared. And he flees and he goes to work for his uncle, Uncle Laban. When he's in the fields, there's a shepherdess in the fields who happens to be the daughter of Laban. And he looks at her and he falls immediately head over heels in love with Rachel. Rachel was gorgeous. And they two became so entwined together. And, uh, and so finally he approaches uncle. Yes, if you're doing the math, you can figure out that Rachel was his cousin. Um, he sees Rachel and he knows this is who I want to spend the rest of my life with. So he goes to his uncle, Uncle Laban, and says, what do I need to do to marry Rachel? He says, you need to work in the field for me for seven years. I said, okay, I'll do that. Seven years pass by, comes time for the wedding. Jacob wakes up the morning after his wedding, and lo and behold, he's married to Leah, not the sister he wanted to be married to. And so uh, Jacob goes to uh, Laban and said, you tricked me. And he said, well, you know, the oldest daughter has to marry first, so you had to marry Leah. He goes, well, what do I need to do to marry Rachel? You need to work another seven years in the field. And Rachel means so much to him that he decides he's going to do that. And so for an additional seven years, he works in the field to achieve and be married to, uh, to, married to Rachel. So you have Le Rachel and Leah. So now the act one actually begins, and as we, uh, the, with the birth of Joseph. Well, Jacob and Rachel weren't really able to have children for a long time. And so Leah began having sons. And she had Reuben, then she had Simeon, and then she had Levi. And then she had Judah. Judah is very important in this because in the lineage from Adam to Jesus Christ, Judah was the branch through which Jesus Christ went through, through the sons of, of Abraham. You also remember that Jacob uh, was also renamed by God Israel. And so you'll hear the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of, of Jacob. And so it comes and he's, Rachel and Jacob are just not able to have, have a child. And so he is given to his handmaiden, and they have children, they have children. Finally, the 11th child born is Joseph. And Joseph was born of Rachel, her very first. Later down the road, about another seven years or so, she finally has another son named Benjamin, and we'll talk about Benjamin here in just a moment. And actually, Rachel died in childbirth when she gave birth to Benjamin. But because Jacob was so in love with Rachel, Finally, when Joseph came along, he was the favored son, no question. And so Joseph became the favored son. There were 12 boys plus one girl in, the, in that family. Joseph was growing up. His father gave him the coat of many colors because he was so special to him. Sometimes I think Joseph didn't make the wisest decisions. And he went to his brothers one time and he said, I want to tell you about two dreams that I had. My first dream was that we were in the field and we were all sheaves and all of you, all the sheaves bowed down to my sheave. The second dream that he had was uh, we were in the, 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 in the sky and all the sun, moon and stars all bowed down to me. Well, they were tired of this dad special to start with. And so uh, later down the road, Joseph's 17 years old. And about that time, as best guess they could see, Benjamin was, would be about 10. Benjamin was too young to go into the field. And so he sent Joseph, his favorite son, into the field and said, I want you to go check on your brothers. So he goes and he goes to check on his brothers. And they see him coming in the distance. Well, they don't like Joseph. He's always been the favored one. And if we get rid of the favored one, maybe things will be better for us. Reuben, being the oldest, and then, so they wanted to kill him. Reuben being the oldest said, let's don't kill him. Let's just throw him in this pit over here 
And then Reuben's plan was, I'm going to come back and I'm going to rescue him and then do away with him. Well, Reuben took off. About the time they had Joseph in the pit for a while, a group of Ishmaelites, remember Ishmael we talked about uh, just a minute ago, came by and they decided to sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites. That's act one. Act two, Joseph, when, when the Ishmaelites get to Egypt, Joseph is resold to Potiphar. He's the captain of the guards for Pharaoh. He's about 17 years old, and he spends about the years 17 through 28 in the home of Potiphar. You read from our scripture, Potiphar saw that God was with Joseph, and he made him head of his household. Well, he was head of the household for a number of years, and then a time when he went into Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife was there. And she was attracted to Joseph. Joseph was a very good looking man. And it was just the two of them in there. And she made a pass at, at Joseph. And Joseph thought, I'm not going to take part in this. And so he slipped out. But when he slipped out, Potiphar's wife grabbed his jacket and headed out with his jacket. Well, he would rather keep his character than his coat at that point. And he slipped out. But when he slipped out, what did Potiphar's wife do? Said he, she brought the coat and said, "Look what he has done. He is, he is." She turned the story totally around, and Potiphar said, "Well, what should I do?" And he said, "You should put this man in prison." So here we go, Joseph, favorite son, down to being sold, thrown in a pit. Joseph goes to Potiphar's house, becomes head of the household. Now he's taken to prison. Ups and downs, ups and downs. And so Joseph is put in prison. But the prison warden saw that God was with Joseph, and he put him in charge of all the prisoners. So he was the convict in charge. While he was there, two people in prison had a dream, a cupbearer and a baker. And they had a dream, and, and Joseph, they, they asked him to interpret the dream, and so he did, and he gave them the interpretation. One of you will be restored to the kingdom, the other will be, will be killed, and the birds will eat your flesh. Well, that exact thing happened. And so Joseph said, so sure enough, three days later, the cupbearer was restored to uh, Pharaoh's house. And he said on the way out to Joseph, I will remember you. Thank you for your interpretation. I'll remember you. Well, what happens? Two years passes. He didn't remember very often. So two years down the road, now we have Joseph at age 30. And so Pharaoh is asleep. He has a dream. First dream was about fat cows and skinny cows. Seven fat cows, seven skinny cows. And the seven skinny cows eat the seven fat cows. He wakes up and, and thinks, that's crazy. So then he falls asleep again. And there's seven sheaves of grain that are fat and healthy and seven sheaves of grain that are thin. And the seven sheaves of grain that are thin overtake the fat grain. And so he wakes up troubled of having these. And so he sends all his, his magicians, his, the magi, and all these different people and said, can you help me interpret this dream? There was found no one in the land who could help interpret this dream that Pharaoh had had. So finally, two years later, the cupbearer remembers, ah, Joseph interpreted the dream. So faster than you can say divine providence, they had cleaned Joseph up shaved him, put him in clean clothes, and sent him to Pharaoh. Pharaoh reveals his dream. Joseph says, oh, that's easy. That's first grade math. What it is, is you're going to have seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of want. And what you need to do is find someone who you can put in charge and manage this time of plenty so that when it becomes time of want, your people will not be wanting and your, and your people will survive. Well, Joseph, uh, Pharaoh figured if he interpreted the dream, he should be the person. So, uh, so Pharaoh made Joseph the prime minister. And so here we have Joseph. He's gone from the pit to prison. Now he's in the palace to become prime minister to show God's divine providence in what's going on. So sure enough, the seven years of plenty happened, and what they did was took 20% of all they had, put it in the silos. It got to be so much they couldn't even count all the grain that they had. Well, now go back over to the land of Canaan where we have Jacob 
and his now 11 sons, and all of a sudden they ran out of food because of famine. And Jacob said to the 11, said, you have, um, why don't you go to Egypt and approach, and I hear they have grain. So they didn't know what they were doing, and take silver, buy this food. So they took silver and they, they approached and they came to Egypt, all except for one son, Benjamin, who stayed behind with Jacob to take care of Jacob. And so they, they approach, immediately when he sees them coming, Jacob know, uh, Joseph knows that these are my brothers. And he comes and he, first of all, he accuses them of being spies and he puts them in prison for three days. And then he brings them out and he says, I still think you're spies, but I'll tell you what I'll do. Tell me, tell me your story. They said, well, we are 12 brothers and one of our brothers is left behind and one of our brothers is no longer. And so he said, well, I'll tell you what, if you're telling me the truth, I'll let you go. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep the second son. His name was Simeon. And so what I'd like for you to do is just to prove to me that you're honest. I'd like to keep Simeon. And so he keeps Simeon. And then I'd like for you to return to the land of Canaan. And I'd like for you to bring back Benjamin, his younger son by Rachel. And so um, they give up because they don't know what else to do. And so they agree to do this. So you can picture them with donkeys and the sacks are hanging of donkeys. They put all the grain in, the, in there and they head out. They're headed back to the land of Canaan. And so on the first night, it was an overnight trip. So on the first night, they stop. And they go to feed the donkey and they open up the first bag. And when they open up the first bag, guess what? The silver that they purchased the grain with was actually in the bag. Everything that they've spent on the grain, not only was the grain was there, but the silver was there as well. And they thought, oh my goodness, not only does he think we're spies, now he's going to think we're thieves. You know, what are we going to do? And so they went on their way, went back to Jacob in the land of Canaan, told him everything that had occurred. They didn't know really what to do. And so they stayed for a while. They ate the grain. Eventually the grain ran out because there was a famine and there was no more coming in. And Jacob called Reuben, the oldest son, and said, you guys need to go back. And Reuben said, let me remember what Joseph said, that if we were to be proved honest, we had to take Benjamin with us. And Jacob said, oh, you can't do that. I've already lost my son. I've lost a second son because Simeon is in jail in Egypt. And now you want me to lose my second son by Rachel? And Reuben said, I promise on the lives of my two sons that I will bring him back to you alive. Time went by, things got worse. They thought they'd kind of tough it out. Judah, if you remember, the fourth born son comes and said, I promise I will take care of Benjamin. Finally, Jacob said, fine, but if you don't bring back Benjamin, that will put me in the grave. That'll be the final straw that puts me in the grave. And so they load up, including Benjamin. Now all 11 brothers, except for Simeon, who's in jail. So 10 of them, they head to Egypt. When they get to Egypt, Joseph sees them coming out in the distance. And Joseph says, go to them and tell them to meet me at my house for noon. Well, when Jacob had thought about them going back, they took the original silver they got, they took a double amount. They took the amount to buy more things. Plus he brought all these gifts to, uh, to Jacob. So they were really scared now that he's gonna take us to his home. He's gonna make us slaves. He's gonna steal our donkeys. So there it arrives at noon and the Egyptians and the Hebrews do not eat together because they're from different sides of the track. The Egyptians are highbrow and the Hebrews are blue collar. And so they eat together. And uh, all of a sudden when the food comes out, Benjamin has five times the food that, that he has. And so they strike out the next morning, going back to land. They said, so he tells his steward, tell you what, fill up all their bags with grain again, put all the original silver back in the bag. And in Benjamin's bag, I want you to put my silver cup. Steward looks at him and says, okay, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do that. And so they get on the road, they're 30 minutes, an hour out of town. And he sends his steward and says, tell them, I can't believe that you have repaid evil for good after I've done all this for you. Uh, somebody has stolen from me. Somebody has stolen my silver cup. 
And Reuben said, there's no way, none of us stole your silver cup. If you find anyone who's did it among my group, may they be put to death. Well, they searched all the bags, and sure enough, when they came to Benjamin's bag, there was a silver cup. So, in fear and trepidation, they brought all those brothers back to Joseph's house. And Joseph said, I can't believe that you did this. And he got about that far. He sent the Egyptians out of the room. And he said, I am Joseph. I am your brother. It's been 22 years since they'd seen him. And he probably looked a little bit like Yul Brynner. Bald head, jacket. They didn't recognize him at all. Didn't look like the Joseph that they, scraggly 17 year old that they threw into the pit. When they found out that it was Joseph, and the first question Joseph asked is, is my father still alive? They said, yes, your father's still alive. Then they were really scared. They were really scared because now Joseph was the prime minister of all of Egypt and they were at his mercy, this person that they've done wrong. Joseph chose to use divine providence and filter what had happened. And he said, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. What has happened with me is something that God allowed to happen so that many lives can be saved. So what I'd like for you to do is go back and get Jacob, my father, and bring him here to me. I will give him the best in the land. Well, Pharaoh heard about this. You weren't sure how Pharaoh would approach that and what he thought. When Pharaoh heard that, that Joseph's brothers, he was so indebted to Joseph that he said, send all my chariots, send and bring them back. Bring back your father and your brothers and all their family. We'll put them in the land of Goshen. They don't need to bring a thing with them because I'm going to give them everything that they need food-wise, animal-wise, all their supplies, everything that they will need. And so surely, en sure enough, all the, the arrived, the brothers go back to Jacob and say, Joseph is alive. So they take Joseph in and they take Jacob, all the chariots, they load up, they come. And this is the highlight of the story. When Jacob finally sees Joseph, the son that he thought was dead, that he hadn't seen in 22 years since he sent out into the field. And he said, I can now die because I have seen that you are alive. Joseph said again to his brothers, who were still fearful for, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. So we get to the epilogue. What does that story teach us? It happens to be one of my favorite stories. I'm going to share a favorite story and I'm going to share one of my favorite songs with you as well. You can't judge God from one moment in time. You can't take a slice in your life and say God is a good God or God is a bad God. I don't know about you, but I can look over my life, my shoulder and see how perfectly God has worked out everything. But as I look to the future, maybe it's not so certain. And some of you might find yourselves in that, in that place. So if we think about Theology 101, probably at the top of Theology 101 would be the words divine providence. And if divine providence were a hymn, it'd have two verses. The first verse would be that God sustains everything. If you have the question, is God actively involved in creation? Let me tell you that it's a firm yes. If we had the response of deism, it would be God wound up the clock and let it run. And when it runs out, it runs out. If we respond with pantheism, it means that God really doesn't have a role. We're all kind of like him, and uh, we all, there's no supreme being. Obviously, if we respond with atheism, the atheism is there is no God, so he doesn't control anything. But through Scripture, over and over again, we see divine providence. For you see, God leads, he manages, he directs. In Hebrews 1.3, the Hebrew writer said, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. 
God is the engineer on the train that keeps the train moving towards its destination to move from point A to point B, to keep the train on the track, no matter what they encounter around what curves it may be. Paul said in Colossians 1.17, he existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Job said in, in, thir- in the 34th chapter, if God were to take back his spirit and withdraw his breath, all life would cease and humanity would turn again to dust. It's because of God that the water stays wet. It's because of God that the rocks stay firm. It's because of God that this week the laws of gravity and thermodynamics will be the same next week because God sustains all that through that. It's because of him that spring follows winter. It's because of God that winter follows autumn. So the first verse of the, of the hymn of D- divine providence is that God sustains everything. But closely behind it is a second verse is God uses everything. So no matter what the train of our life occurs, God uses everything. Paul said in Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. You could wear out a highlighter on that verse and you could preach multiple sermons just on that one verse and all that's entitled in there. All of those things say that God is in charge. He is the master. Well, if God is in charge, why was Joseph thrown into prison? God is in charge. Why did my child have cancer? God is in charge. Why was Joseph thrown in the pit? If God is in charge, why did I lose my spouse? We have to be very careful here. God uses these things, but God does not ordain or endorse evil. That is nowhere in the scripture. He uses whatever evil happens to still accomplish his will. God is not sometimes sovereign. He's either sovereign or he's not sovereign. He's either sovereign all the time or he's sovereign none of the time. God is sovereign. The scripture at the end that I've repeated several times, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. The word intended in Hebrew is the same word as the word wove. And so if you look at that, what you wove into my life, being thrown into the pit, prison, God took it apart and rewove it for good. Sometimes you feel like the ups and downs, that sometimes you're just stuck. And you think, if there is a God, where is he? And why is he, why is he acting in my life? Why is he getting me through this? No different than, than Joseph thought it wasn't going to be two years before he got out of jail. This has a, been an important thing for me to hear. When you find yourself in Egypt, just do the next right thing. So let me repeat that. When you find yourself in Egypt, just do the next right thing. God is indeed the, art, the master and your architect of your life. He's here this morning to sustain you. He's here to use whatever you encounter in your life for his will and for his good. You need the touch of the master's hand in your life. You saw time and time again in this story where they saw God present in Joseph's life and because they saw God present in Joseph's life, he was elevated. Let me my encouragement to you this morning. Let that touch of the master's hand touch you this morning. 
bottom line is life is hard. We're either going through a struggle right now or we've just finished a struggle or there's one right around the corner. But the thing you need to know as you walk through those struggles, you have the touch of the master's hand on your life and that God will sustain you while you're in Egypt and God will use whatever you have in your life. I'd like to share a song with you if I can. I heard this song about, it's hard to admit, it was about 45 years ago. Uh, by a guy named Al Fike. It's called The Touch of the Master's Hand. You know, what we saw in the story of Joseph was how he was just an average guy and he was put in and he was depressed and put into place. And then God elevated him because people saw that God was present in Joseph's life. And what might be a random act and what might be a random person became something very special because God was present in his life. Well, it was battered and scarred and the auctioneer felt it was hardly worth his while to waste much time on the old violin but he held it up to smile It sure ain't much but it's all we got left I guess we ought to sell it now who'll start the bids on this old violin? Just one more and we'll be through. And he cried, one, give me one dollar, who'll make it two? Only two dollars, who'll make it three? Well, three dollars price, now that's a good price. Who's got a bid for me? Raise up your hand, don't wait any longer. The auction's about to end Well, who's got four? Just one dollar more To put on a soul fire Well, the air was hot And the people stood round And the sun was setting low From the back of the crowd A great man came forward And picked up four more he wiped the dust from the old island And he tightened up the streets And he played out a melody good and sweet As sweet as the angels can see Then the music ceased in the auctioneer With a voice that was quiet and low He said, now what am I bid for this old violin? And he held it up And he cried, one, give me one thousand, who'll make it two? Only two thousand, who'll make it three? Well, three thousand twice, now that's a good price. Who's got a bid for me? The people cried out, what made the change? We don't understand. The auctioneer stopped, and he said with a smile, it was the time. The master's hand. Well, now you know many a man whose life out of tune is battered and scarred with sin. And he's auctioned sheep to a thankless world, much like that old violin. But the master comes and the foolish crowd, they never understand the worth of his soul. Of the master's hand. Well, he cried, One, give me one thousand, who we'll make it two? Only two thousand, who we'll make it three? With well, three thousand dice, now that's a good price. Who's got a bid for me? The people cried out, What made the change? We don't understand. The auctioneer stopped. And he said with a smile, it was the touch of the master's hand. We need the touch of the master's hand.
of the master's hand. And so my friends, this morning, wherever you find yourself in life, wherever you find yourself on life's ups and downs, God loves you. He's here to sustain you, give you everything you need. And He's here to also teach you that He's going to use everything that He's put in your life for His good. And most importantly, if you're really struggling this morning and feel like you're stuck, when you find yourself in Egypt, just do the next right thing and let God work this morning. All honor and praise to God. Our statement of faith is printed in your bulletin from the Confession of 1967. Would you please join me? The reconciling work of Jesus was a supreme crisis in the life of humankind. Jesus' cross and resurrection became a personal crisis and present hope for people when the gospel is proclaimed and believed. In this, the Spirit that brings God's forgiveness to people, moves them to respond in faith, repentance, and obedience, and initiates a new life in Christ. This new life takes place in a community in which persons know that God loves and accepts them in spite of what they are. They, therefore, accept themselves and love others, knowing that no person has any ground on which to stand except God's grace. Do you join in singing together hymn number 738, standing as we sing together, O Master, let me walk with thee. I would ask you to join me in the prayer of thanksgiving, consecration, intercession, followed in unison with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. As the summer days move rapidly toward the business of autumn, our attention is drawn forward 
We began to think about all that is coming, children preparing for the new school year, young people off to service, work or college, return to regular work schedules, preparations for retirement. There are so many things looming on our horizons that our focus is placed on them. Be with us, loving God. Remind us to place our focus on Jesus, who calls us to trust in His mercy and His care. Keep the needs of others in our hearts and minds, needs for healing, for comfort, for friendship. Help us to reach out to them and offer our gifts and service in your name. We name these dear ones with our voices and in our hearts to you in these next moments of silence. As you have loved and healed us, so we ask your healing mercies on these whom we have named. We also ask your guidance and patience with us as we march through the last weeks of summer, confident in Jesus' love for us. We unite our voices as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, just as Joseph this week, I encourage you as you go through this week to lift high the cross and let Christ be known. Would you stand and sing him number 826, him 826, lift high the cross.
David, thank you for being with us and for your word. Next Sunday, your preacher will be Byron Walston. Byron, would you raise your hand so people know you? Good to have you. And uh, Sally Kate in the back will be preaching two weeks from today. So we hope you're here for both instances and hear the words proclaimed by these very wise and knowledgeable and devoted laypersons. No licensed preachers. <laughs> David spoke to you about uh, how Joseph was brought from many levels of life, eventually to a period of uh, superiority and fame and ministry, and reminds us that even though evil may be designed for us, God's wisdom and love will proclaim and convert that into goodness. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, the word came to Jeremiah, a very young man. Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, good plans, not plans to bring you evil, but plans to prosper you with a de delightful future. Even though those words were spoken to Jeremiah long after Joseph, I think they would have been appropriate for Joseph. But certainly, as each one of you leave this place today, Jeremiah 29, 11 are most appropriate for you to employ along your journey too. Beloved, I know the plans I have for you, not evil plans, but plans to prosper you, good plans, with a delightful future. Go now in peace, gratitude, joy, and service, knowing that the Lord Christ is with you every step of the way. Alleluia. Amen.